Welcome to the third episode of the Northern Art Podcast with me, Ant Cosgrove. I hope you've enjoyed the two previous episodes, and if you've not heard them yet, you can go and check them out on Spotify or YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. I've got various guests in mind um, for the podcast, but when I set it up initially, the guest that I've managed to get on today was somebody that I really wanted to speak to from the very beginning. In my opinion, he's one of the greatest living landscape painters in Britain. He was born in 1941 in Warrington, he studied in Liverpool and in London, and went on to teach in Liverpool for many years as the head of the fine art department there. His painting career spans 60 years, and he has exhibited widely during that time, especially around Liverpool and in North Wales. More recently, he had an acclaimed show in Hong Kong, and a retrospective a couple of years ago at the excellent Whitaker Gallery, which, uh, which was an incredible show. And also, just to say, his work is available from Dave Gunning at Todmorden Fine Art. So, without further ado, my guest today on the third episode of the Northern Art Podcast is Mike Knowles. Hi Mike, how are you doing? Well, as well as can be expected, I think is the best way to put it. Alright, very good. Um, yeah, good, good battle really, yeah. Right, it's just, how have you, uh, how's everything been with, with this lockdown situation over in Anglesey? Has it affected you at all? Oh, uh, well, life goes on much as normal for us really. Yeah. Studio uh, so. chores, that's about it. Yeah, okay, yep. fair enough. I know it's funny because, you know, with the art world during this pandemic at the moment, you are seeing some artists responding to it in different ways. And I think that some artists are feeling like they have to try and respond to it somehow, you know, and that's and that's what they should do. They, you know, I guess like almost like a war artist might have done, um, but they're thinking, well, I need to do something to it. But then uh, really, I, I don't really know, you know, I don't know how, you know, I don't really know, to be honest with you. It's a funny sort of thing, isn't it, really? Um, but yeah, you're just carrying on doing your painting, aren't you? That's the thing. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've never been interested in issue-based painting, really. No, that's it. That's it. No, no, no real interest in it. But um, yeah. well, you know, I do like to make transcriptions to other artists from time to time. I found myself browsing to Kusan, who's one of my favourite artists, mm-hmm. and just came across a very early Pieta. Right. Uh, it just seemed it seemed to speak to me at the time, and a friend had just lost somebody, and I just painted a, a quick little version of the first language. So I suppose that would be my nod towards COVID, really. Right. Okay. So, Mike, um, you were born in Warrington. What were your sort of early days and early memories of, um, when did you first become interested in art, really? Well, I think I probably always had a sort of natural interest in it, really. I, was, I, mean, I lived on the outskirts of Warrington, but... Uh, okay. My school and all my relatives so lived in the middle of town. It was a very busy industrial town in those days. Right. My parents were both working, and uh, my mother um, did office work for one of the factories, and so there was always a plentiful supply of project papers to draw. Right. So I've drawn from my earliest days, really. Mm-hmm. And the other great thing at that time was uh, we had a full set of art from these children's encyclopedias. Right. Which had lovely sort of uh, sepia-looking reproductions of all sorts of art. Particularly, I remember Michelangelo sculptures, uh, which I found very moving at the time. Mm. I was a, a sickly child. Uh, I think most of the poisonous fumes that used to sort of hang around Warrington and witness. Mm. Uh, so I spent a lot of time off school. And when I was 13, 14, so that, um, there was a big Van Gogh exhibition at the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool. The collection that belonged to the family, uh, one we called the engineer, or I think it was a grandson, right. or great nephew, um, Theo's son, before he left his collection to the museum in Amsterdam, the Black Box, now the Van Gogh Museum, yeah. he sent his collection off on a world tour and it came to Liverpool. Right. Um, the art teacher took a little trip in to see it. Absolutely marvellous. Coincidentally, uh, an ex-door neighbour worked on the nearby American Air Base where we lived and had access to the library. And, uh, because he knew I was interested in art, he bought me one of these Skira books on Van Gogh. So right. the paintings I loved at that time of Van Gogh, which I remember most vividly from the exhibition of the book, were, were the early ones. Mm. Possibly the most gloomy in some ways, but the paintings of the boots and the potato eaters. And yes, of course. A view yeah. across the rooftops of Paris, they were painted and stuck in my mind. Yeah. Uh, uh, but okay. then, uh, at school, I, I stopped doing art at UCE level and then languished in the sixth form for year after year, getting worse results in my A levels every year. <laughs> and halfway through the autumn term, the, uh, the art master, who I'd not spoken to for three or four years, saw me sitting on a corridor and doodling in my gutter. 
then how old is you? Uh eighteen. Right, okay. And I said, Oh, really? what's that like? What what do you have to do to go out of school? He said, Look, he said, I'll give you a letter, take this to Liverpool Art School today and ask for a chap called Alfred Ballard. <laughs> so I got the letter off him, jumped on the train into Liverpool in my school uniform, found the art school. The only work I had to show them with a doodle was in this yacht that I was I'd been drawing in and uh <laughs> They said, oh, that's all right, you can start. I said, oh, when? <laughs> he said, well, well now. Yeah, they yeah. go upstairs, room 78, and see Mr. Whitton, and <laughs> he'll sort you out. So I trotted up upstairs in my school uniform, this is halfway through the autumn term, uh, found, found room 78, went in, found Mr. Whitton, and then suddenly there, I, I was staring at a naked woman. Oh, my God. <laughs> and everybody else, of course, has settled into being art students. Yeah. Lots of mature students get paid with double coats and things. And he gave me a pencil and a board, a paper, and said, start work. I never went back to school, never collected my books. Oh, and after about three days, I thought I'd gone to heaven. <laughs> it was just wonderful. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so you had teachers there, didn't you, as well, which obviously, um, Arthur Ballard and, was it Charles Burton, I think, was another guy? Yeah, it was, was a, it was a terrific staff. Charlie Burton, Arthur Ballard was motivational. Yeah. Charlie Burton, who was had a painting, was terrific. Uh, he brought in stuff like Peter Crabtree and yeah. Heinz Koppel. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nicholas Horsfield, uh, <laughs> a, a lifelong friend, really. Yeah. Uh, well, Charlie has a Char- I mean, Char- Yeah, Charles, he's still alive, isn't he, Charles? He's still, he's still alive. He is painting. indeed, and just had his 90th birthday. Just had his 90th birthday. Right. Fantastic. It was superb. Yeah, I know uh, there was an exhibition, wasn't there, um, at the um, Martin Tinney Gallery a year Martin or two back? Gallery, yes, and a new right. book. It's a very good book, actually, isn't it? I did get. A, I yep. saw your copy and I bought it subsequently. Yeah. So that was very good. So that was um, that was in Liverpool, obviously. So that was 1959 to <laughs> 1963. So you have done my yeah. research, yeah? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of that course, we used to have an exam called the NDD, the National Diploma in Design. Right. Um, I failed. That was the lowest mark. <laughs> <laughs> in the college's history. <laughs> um, okay. So I got myself a job in a, a lemonade factory with the help of a friend. I didn't know this, and, right? Okay, yeah. And carried on painting and decided I would apply to the Royal College on the slave. Yeah. And I was, I was, I think I was, I was rather a temperamental lad, you know. And uh, hmm. so when the stuff was due to go off, I'd made this big packing case and stuffed all the paintings in, but I'd decided it was awful, I wasn't going to do it. And it happened to be for my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. Yeah. She finished packing the stuff up and got me to take it down to London, so I, I think I sent it to London to the Royal College. Newly got to letter back then, they weren't accepting me to collect the work. Right. I thought, oh, i that, I'll, I'll take it to the slave. Mm. So I got the bus down to London, got to the Royal College, got the crate into a taxi, took it over to the slave, and not to the slave, Seemed very posh to me as a slave. He saw a beadle at the door with a uniform and a top hat and everything. And, yeah. uh, he sent for the technician and tapped on the tank to light. So, Michael, uh, he came and said, What do you want? I said, Well, I brought my work. He said, Too late, it's closed. Well, bug it off. Mm-hmm. I said, Well, I've come all this way from Liverpool. He said, Go on, bug it off, you're too late. So, I got this packing case, started to look at it and He says, Where are you going? I said, Well, he said, Give it here. And he took it in for me. Right. Uh, the amazingly irascible Michael Holmes, he was, yes, he was a fine technician, but uh, the most bad tempered man you could possibly meet, but very fine. And uh, eventually I got an interview at the Slade, yeah. packed in my job at the Lemonade Factory, mm-hmm. and muddled off down there. Had this strange interview, took a little roll of drawings in the inside pocket to show them they were looking at my work. And, well, they said, well, no, it seems you're a difficult student. It seems you don't take any notice of your tutors. Nonsense. I said, I just don't always agree with him. <laughs> so, he said, well, you've got to pass this NDD to get a grant. So I went back to Liverpool and told them I wanted to uh, reset the NDD at the office. And yeah. he said, oh, I'm sorry, uh, you've got to go and see the principal. So I toddled off to see the principal. He said, oh, no. He said, yes. He said, uh, you've been a disgrace to this college. He said, not only do you take no notice of your tutors, you dress like a bloody lumberjack. <laughs> I stormed out, went straight upstairs to see Charlie Bird and said, what's all this about being not listening to my shooters? That bugger down there, he won't let us breeze at the NDD. <laughs> Charlie Bird 
Charlie said, oh, don't take any notes of it. He said, look, he said, you don't need to come into college. He said, just wait till the exam comes down. Yeah. Come in through the back door, do your painting, go away, and I'll see you through the rest of it. Right. So I, I did my painting for the NDD. My wife came in and touched up these fingers and toes on my life painting. Mm-hmm. Um, got my NDD and went off to the slate. There you go. You were there from 64 to, well, you were there from 64, weren't you, at uh, that point? Yeah, 64 um, to 66, I think, yeah. yeah. So, obviously, at that time, the Slade was, I mean, you picked a, you picked a good time to go to the Slade, because, <laughs> um, of course, it was it was Coldstream, wasn't it, there, I think, as the uh, sort of... Oh, it was, I, I, I thought it was marvellous. I mean, first of all, you know, they, they just treated everybody very seriously. And, yeah. I mean, I've always been, one way or another, what you'd call a figurative painter. Yeah. But they had a marvellous and varied stuff, but the, the figurative painters there were... Uh, Michael Andrews, Frank Auerbach, uh, Jeffrey Tam, Patrick George, yep. Ewan Hugo. Hugo was there, yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, who were all terrific. And Kossoff as well, I think, as well, didn't he? Was no, Kossoff never taught at the Slade. Oh, right, okay. No, right. no I came to know Kossoff in a, an entirely different way, really. Right, okay. Um, we had a kind of student committee, I forgot what they call it, some kind of art club, which invited other painters to come in and do a kind of crit. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'd have two or three people. We had Hockney and Patrick Crock that came together. They rather camped it up, annoyed me intensely. Although, you know, they're both very good artists in their own way. Mm-hmm. Or were Crock was dead. I said, well, I, I propose we invite Leon Kossoff. Yeah. And I managed to get in touch with him. Mm-hmm. He came along and started off very quietly. And then gradually took his jacket off and took his tie off and got stuck into all the painting. After that, I kept in touch with him. Yeah. But that's how I've known Kossoff. Right, okay. Not as a tutor, but just as a kind of distant friend, really. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Okay, I see. We corresponded and spoke to each other on the phone right through his death. I know, I it, know. Amazing. It was a blow to me, really. I, I regarded him as, regarded him as, you know, probably the greatest living painter in the country. And yeah, he was elsewhere. superb. Yeah, he was superb. I mean, I was uh, fortunate to have a, t- a little bit of correspondence with him but that I did but you know it was just um, it was an amazing amazing painter amazing guy um, so of course yeah the slide there you mentioned some of those names that was what he was doing he was producing figurative paintings weren't you um, under their sort yeah. of influence um, yeah it was a fantastic time obviously to be there what was it like in, in London in general your time in London would you go into the National Gallery I guess quite a lot and, and what was it like at the night and things like that were you out partying with Francis Bacon <laughs> uh, no well, was obviously the, the galleries were just like a a feast. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, the court hall, as it then was, was just around the corner from the slave. Court hall, amazing. Was that's to, that's uh, probably one of my favourite galleries in London. I love it. Yeah, but the old court hall was sort of had to go up in a lift to it in mm-hmm. a building just around the corner from the slave. Right. Uh, so it was like going into somebody's living room. Right. Just to, you know, look at the place. That was wonderful. But the, the national was a feast. Well, a marvellous museum. Not the city, aren't they? I mean, was, uh, was, was that was that the time when you started getting more involved in um, sort of transcriptions? Because you you are you obviously you do you paint landscapes and stuff. Were you in the National Gallery uh, drawing and working into transcriptions and that sort of thing? Is that sort of? I painted about? my first transcription at Liverpool. Right. Okay. Because we used to have to do this thing called figure composition. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a clue what was meant by composition. Well, well, what on earth did I do? I decided to start drawing from Suzanne, who I'd always regarded as being a sort of somewhat eccentric artist. I didn't really understand. Mm. Thought the figures had strange distortions and so forth. So I thought I'll sit down and draw from Suzanne. And the more I grew, the more fascinated I got. I then made a, a version of the bathers, but done more or less entirely in black and a couple of earth colours. Yeah. Just got very excited about it. Around the same time, I'd seen an exhibition called Drawing Towards Painting, which travelled around art school, sent to Liverpool. Yeah, I think I, I think I looked into that. That was, that was right. That was in early 60s, that wasn't it? That was around that sort of time, 61. Yeah. Mm. Probably about the last year of my student life, or well, Anyway, it was an awakening for me. There were wonderful drawings by Uglo, working drawings by Uglo, Albert, Michael Andrews, yeah. Peter Kinley, Spotty Stevenson, who used to stipple stuff onto them, uh, mm-hmm. interesting painters in Newcastle. It was, a, it was an eye opener. I, I mean, I never really understood, although I was kind of quite a um, conventionally talented draftsman, you know, when I'd, I'd get the, you know, a lot of approval for being able to draw. Yeah. I never really understood the relationship between drawing and painting. Mm-hmm. But that clicked. So by the time I got to the slave, I then found I had Frank Howard back as a tutor. <laughs> I think he was a bit starstruck. <laughs> well, I wasn't particularly. <laughs> I didn't know much about him. Uh, I think I'd seen one painting by him, but I'd seen his working drawings. Uh, you had to elect 
somewhere to work. It was late, so I always worked in the life room. The first room I went to, because it was my tutor, mm-hmm. I had my own easel. I, I looked up in there. I had a board ready-made up and all the paints. Looked them into the Frank Auerbach room. Yeah. Set up and started painting. And a couple of students came up and said, but you've not got your name on the door. What do you thought? I said, you have to. You have to get your name put on the door before you can work in here. I thought, that's nonsense. I'm in the middle of painting. Just leave me alone. <laughs> so anyway, the tutors used to come in one or two days a week in those days. Yeah. Um, after all three days, Frank Arbach strolled in. He said, excuse me, what are you doing? Oh, that's the other thing I'm doing. I'm painting. He said, listen, you haven't got your name on the door. I said, yeah. I said, but I'm painting. He said, I'm sorry, you can't paint in here if you've not got your name down on the door. <laughs> So what am I supposed to do? He said, oh, he said, I'll, I'll try and find you something to Let's go see Mike Andrews. He might take you on. So he wheeled me around to Michael Andrews' studio, which Michael was there. Yeah. And he said, oh, yeah, I think you can come and paint with me, which I did. Yeah. And he, he was terrific. Yeah, a fantastic artist with that. I visited his studio once, and he was painting a big painting called Good and Bad at Game. Huge painting. And he was having photographs screen printed onto the camera. Right. So the studio was all blacked out. Then working into them. Um, it got these torn strips of newspaper, so thin strips, so they were left blank after the screen printing. And those slivers of white then became slivers of figures that he painted in, and drifting down these London streets. Fascinating right. painting. Right. Uh, well, a little digression, really. Yeah. Going into the studio, there was a little sort of vestibule area. And in there was this crazy looking painting. I'm painting, so we, I was in there admiring this good and bad against me, and asking questions about his face. What about this strange face again? What the that? Oh, he said, well, he said, you know what it's like? He said, I, I like to go out for a drink, he said, and he said, I usually come home pissed. <laughs> I think I know exactly what to do with the painting. He said, I've ruined so many paintings doing that. He said, I've now got this painting, so it's the first one I see. <laughs> so it's that's all I paint when I come back from the pub. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I don't think that would ever got in no, no. the public. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what happened to it. Um, right, yeah, so of course that was the, that was at Slade, you know, amazing time there. And then um, then you came back up north and you started teaching in 66, I think it was. So it was obviously quite soon after the Slade you started teaching. Was it in, I think, Manchester and Liverpool, I think, initially? Well, I started off in Manchester. Well, Frank Carbach and Michael Andrews wrote letters to the art school in Manchester. Right try and get me some teaching because by that point I'd, I'd got married and I was living in Liverpool we had a lovely tumble down flat in Liverpool I got interviewed by Norman Adams to a painting job in the fine art department mm-hmm. and he just poo pooed my work he said I'm not interested in slave painters uh, mm-hmm. I don't like all that gloomy slave painting my stuff are all low college so it's uh, elite you alive <laughs> well, all right not you then right. so there came out a shop called Norman Rowe who was a friend of Michael Andrews yeah outside and he gave me an interview and gave me a job immediately. He right. wasn't the head of the department, but he got the old case from a stuff called Hoverstaff, he used to be head of the department, right, okay. on the foundation course. So my first teaching was a couple of days a week on the foundation course in Manchester, yeah. where Don McKinley was teaching, right. whose work I knew. Adrian Henry had done some teaching there. Well, a lot of quite interesting people there. Mm-hmm. So I enjoyed that very much and time went on, I thought well, I'd, I'd go back to Liverpool and See if I could collect paintings I'd left behind when I was a student. Yeah. So I, on one of my days not teaching, I went into Liverpool and Charlie Byrne asked me what I was doing and I told him, he said, oh, he said, how'd you like to do some teaching here? I said, oh, yes, that'd be good. I wouldn't be far from travel. So I got two days a week from him and uh, two days a week in Manchester. So I was now doing four days a week teaching. It's yeah. more than I needed, really. That's perfect. Yeah. And uh, at the end of the year, they got me to apply for a full-time job at Liverpool. Right. Which is much better because you actually, in those days, you did about three and a half days actual teaching. Yeah. Because they recognised that you needed time to paint. You know? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Um, it was worth that. was wonderful. I used to, I, I set up a life room there, or took over one of the life rooms, and mm-hmm. worked alongside the student. Um, I was I was going to say that because of course in the sixties, what's going on in the world of that period is you know it's pop art and because well, you're obviously a massive advocate in life drawing and in the life classes. Was that something that was a struggle to get people more wanting to be involved in that, or was it? Uh, didn't seem to be. All artists use their eyes and look mm-hmm. at the world around them, and uh, course, yeah. the human figure. And you know, I'm not, I'm not sort of I'm not somebody with a sort of bigoted view of what yeah, of course, yeah. Be, of course. be. I mean, I. 
you know, I, I, I like all sorts of things. I'm interested in all kinds of things, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They were some marvellous students, you know. It's just, it just a joy to teach them, uh, to work alongside them. And yeah. The whole thing about a life room is, you see, that you're all occupied in a way doing the same thing. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you're a teacher or you're a mature student or a young student. The problems you all face are, are in common and you can learn from each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you're lucky, you've got good models, which are important, I think. Uh, models who know the job, they're scared. Then it becomes a very uh, integrated kind of activity, really. Yeah. You know, models who get dozy and bored, that reflects in your painting, it seems to me. But uh, models who are alert and are interested in what's going on. Was it, it was June Furlong, wasn't it? I think it was one of the, one of the better models. Uh, sort of yes, yeah. June was, but she wasn't the most reliable of models. And what's the... Um, what's the the, uh, the great model for me at Liverpool was, uh, was Sue, Sue Lee. Sue Lee, that's it, Sue Lee. That's uh, who I meant. <laughs> that's who I meant. I've got a picture of, I've got, um, I have got one of you, I think you have, you have seen it, it was a little study, um, a little life drawing yes, study. Right, yeah, yeah it's quite yeah. an early one, I think, I managed to get. Uh, well, I've pa- painted and drew her uh, hundreds of times, really, yeah. I suppose, over the years. Yeah, very uh, good. God bless her, she's still alive in, uh, in a care home in Liverpool. Right, is that and, right? Okay. And she, she's had COVID. And right. recovered. She must be into her, well into her 90s. Right. No, she's a remarkable woman. Yeah, yeah, I didn't realise she was alive. Right. Some of the students who went through that period, I mean, they'll, they'll tell you what an amazing model she was. I mean, yeah. uh, about that time, uh, John Virtue came to teach for yeah. a year. He was a very influential teacher. Right, okay. Terrific draftsman. Yeah. But there are many people whose drawings I, uh, I, I would, you know, really doff my hat to, but mm-hmm. bloody hell he could draw. Right. Uh, I never got on with him. He was an extremely difficult character, in my view. Um, yeah. We we tried to get on with him, but it didn't really work. Mm. And he uh, he eventually sort of uh, disappeared with uh, with one of the students who right. he spent the rest of his life with. I think has done, you know. Oh, there you go. Well, I know. Yeah, he's done done very well for himself, hasn't he? I think he's he's done. Uh, yeah. But to say he, he he left before the end of the year in sort of Strange circumstances, really. Right. Okay. So, so this students. this point, Mike, you was obviously you was um you was teaching Liverpool and painting still. You had a studio at uh, Bridewell. Is that right around that period? Was it in the late sixties you set your studio up there, or was it before then? I'm, I'm, well, it's, it's later I moved to the Bridewell. Really, uh, right. I was I had a big tumble down flat uh, in one of the parks in Liverpool, and I had a little bit of time off because my wife was ill. And, okay. Uh, when, when I came back. Uh, the building had been damn near demolished. Right. Get to my top floor flat, I had to go up a ladder. The building was being renovated. The landlord had decided to take it to his own hands and do it. So I was stuck for somewhere to move to. I had a couple of odd rooms around the, around the thing I stayed in, but uh, somebody, uh, another member of the staff uh, was part of the Bridewell, which was an old police station. Mm-hmm. And he got me a studio there. So I kept that for, for many years, long after I finished teaching at Liverpool. Yeah, for people uh, listening, the Bridewell is a studio sort of space in Liverpool um, for many, many years, and there's a lot of you know Liverpool artists have used it. Over, uh, there could probably be a book written about the Bridewell, I think, and there probably should be uh, at some point. Um, so then um, you're in Liverpool, and just to follow that on now, you've um, you moved to Wales, didn't you? <laughs> Basically, that was in sort of the late, I think around '69, I think it was. How did that come about? How, what made you sort of up sticks? And you were obviously well, a friend of mine was. Was Peter Prendergast. Ah, that's the man, yeah. <laughs> uh, we'd known each other at the Slade. Yes. He was a year or so behind me, I think. But right. uh, we arrived there at the same time mm-hmm. and got on immediately. Um, you know, we're both fairly working class background and yep. he was very keen on his rugby and hmm. I like sports as well. And uh, so we were, I think we both were kind of outsiders really at the Slade. And, but right. we, you know, we, we became good friends. And after he finished at the Slade, he, he went on to be a Porsche guard at Reading. Yep. And he was looking for work, and he'd moved up to North Wales. He'd saved up some money and bought a very cheap cottage in Bethesda. Mm-hmm. And we'd kept in touch. And I knew that Liverpool were looking for part-time staff. Probably about the same time that Don Virtue came, I think. Right, okay. uh, he came up for an interview and got some teaching in the fine art department and also on the foundation course. Right. He rang me up from Wales one day and said, uh, I'd, I'd been thinking of moving somewhere into the countryside. Yeah. By then I had a, a young daughter, mm-hmm. another one on the way. But anyway, he rang me up and said, I found, I found your, I found your cottage, mm-hmm. 600 pounds. <laughs> I thought, well, that sounds right. Get your 
myself out here this weekend. He said, "Have a look, see what you think." Yeah. So I I packed the uh, I packed my my wife and daughter <laughs> uh, into my old Land Rover and drove out to Wales. Found Peter's cottage that he was living in. Yeah. He said, "Well, he said, uh, he said I've got some bad news." I said, "What's that?" He said, "I bought the cottage." <laughs> okay. Oh, you said, but next door's for sale. Right. So he took me up there to see it, because he bought this little single story cottage on one end of a group of three cottages, mm. halfway up a mountain, south of Peter, missed the town, but the middle of the house of the three was for sale, and the farmer lived in the furthest one. Mm. I told the farmer, well, how much do you want for it? Back to what I say, £1,300. I thought I could raise that somewhere. I said, mm. well, we'll have it. He said, well, look, you don't have to give me the money right away. He said, move in, and see what you think of it, and then we can start this up later. It's, it's <laughs> marvellous. You can't so do that now. <laughs> I know, so we did trips out to there. And it had no, no running water. Right. Uh, wow. it, had, it had electricity. Yeah. The lavatory was across the field in a little stone building. <laughs> right. It was a cesspit outside where you had to sit everything. Right. It seemed marvellous, but it would be there for going there for about three months before, before we saw what was behind the house because the mist was always down. Right. Back of the house was this bloody great mountain, which was, you know, it's all very exciting. So we moved. First of all, my, my wife and daughter moved there and I was travelling out for long weekends. Mm-hmm. Eventually, it's nice to sell the house in Liverpool and gradually renovated the place. Peter mm-hmm. was next door. That was the worst move we ever made. We stopped being good friends living next door to each other. <laughs> It was only after he moved and we managed to find ourselves about 20 miles apart that uh, our friendship blossomed again. Uh, we yeah. were terrible neighbours. Oh dear, you always fall uh, out. <laughs> well, I, th- I think there was probably a competitive spirit between us, you know. <laughs> uh, Peter was a very competitive person as well. Right, I love Peter. I love, I love Peter's work, obviously. I've got quite a few of his work. He's a fantastic, well, fantastic painter. Well, perfect painter. And, so he's one of those painters who got better and better, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. when I knew that the Slade, I think I was probably quite uh, quite condescending. Because mm. he was younger and had to start lower down the program. And he was painting, so what seemed to me then was very, very crude little paintings. Mm. I didn't think a great deal of, you know, lots of black lines that's holding the colour in. And it was really after I'd left the Slade that I, I corresponded with Frank Albach and he, in a letter he said, uh, You'll be really surprised that he's doing some very good painting. Right. Peter Prendergast. Mm-hmm. He knew I'd be surprised because, you know, Peter hadn't blossomed. Yeah. At yeah. the point when I left the slate. But mm-hmm. my God, he took off after that. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it just got better and better. So it was on the basis of that that I got him to come up to Liverpool. Yes. For the part time teaching interview. And he was a good teacher, both in the fine art department and on the foundation course. Fantastic. Yeah, so um So that was it and then, and so obviously you were painting um you were painting there in Wales then, weren't you? That was a sort of that change you Well were... I managed to rent a nearby semi derelict cottage for I think it was it seemed quite a lot at the time, three pounds a week I think. <laughs> okay. and, uh, and at that time I I then decided I'd I I was I couldn't cope with the landscape around there and I said I've just got to have more time and uh, I came to a deal with the college that I could go on half pay right. and have half my time in Wales, right. which I did. It was a real struggle to get, get my work moving in Wales. It was only suddenly when I realised that uh, the thing for me to do, instead of trying to paint these mountains, yeah. just turn the face the other way and we're a thousand feet up and we looked out at the western sky. Right. Of course, I was brought up as a, as a child and young person in Warrington, looking out at the western sky from our back window, mm. which was glorious because the, the skies in industrial Merseyside were wonderful. You know, there was so much pollution. Yeah. The, the colour was fantastic. Mm. So really, my breakthrough in Wales was to turn around and look out at these great panoramas in the great western sky. Yeah, I think I think of that when I think of your work in, at Liverpool in that time, sorry, in Wales in that time of the panoramic skies and things. I think that's sort of what I think of when I think of your earlier work at that period. Um, yeah, well, skies have continued to fascinate me, really. Yeah, uh, still do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. In fact, I found it difficult when we moved to Anglesey because at first the whole place looked like a bloody golf course, really. <laughs> Well, that was in, uh, what year was that? When you, it was in 77, I think, you moved to Anglesey. So you were sort of, you sold up um, there in Bethesda and you decided to move even yeah. further away from Liverpool. 
<laughs> over into Anglesey. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, that was it. <laughs> and it's quite the top end of Anglesey as well. It's like it's, you're not just over the bridge, are you? You're quite. A, you're no, quite no, a it's the northeast corner. <laughs> yeah, right in the corner. Uh, yeah. Well, you, you, that's my wife Ronnie, who's a, a very good painter in her own right. But put up with a lot, really. I think she's also a keen gardener. Works works very hard at it. Works very hard at the painting when she does painting. Works very hard at the garden when she's gardening. It was really her example that got me sort of in, into the painting angle to it more enthusiasm because I've always tended to look towards her horizon to the big panorama. Yeah. And she's always looked what is close in front of her. I mean, you will paint a clump of flowers that you would walk past, you know. Yeah. With great scrutiny. And it's only through her example, really, that I started looking much more closely at nature around me. You know, the way trees grow and hedgerows, uh, the closer landscape. And it was really that that sort of got me moving again when we moved to Anglesey. I've written something about your work here that I'm just making, just reading it now as I'm sort of as I'm talking to you. I think I thought that the the work that when you were at Anglesey it become more intimate and not as panoramic and it was not scenic and it wasn't like you were you're not looking for landmarks or anything like that. You're trying to make sense of the immediacy of nature and the world around you and and you're doing that through like observation, through drawings, and then pushing the paint around really to sort of get those responses on onto paper or canvas or whatever. And that's sort of what I thought of the work, really. Well, I, I guess I've always felt that your best bet of doing anything of any meaning is, is to work from the things that you see yeah. every day. Yeah. Now, you know, for much of my life, it was the panorama and the big sky. That was even in Liverpool. In Liverpool's that kind of place. Of course. But I, Angus, that I, I found harder, but, you know, gradually, I mean, walking down the fields every day and getting the feel of things and then drawing. I mean, drawing is essential, I think. Yeah. It's, uh, well, I, I didn't say this, but, uh, for say, the longer, the, uh, the drawing is the probity of art, mm -hmm. which I think is a, is a, you know, it's a lovely diction. That, that's the key to everything, I think. I rather object to the fact that, you know, people seem to think that drawing is important, so that drawing is about waving laser beams or whatever, you know. But to, to me, I mean, the, the simple act of looking and responding with a, a mark making implement in your hand and a, a piece of paper or whatever to, to draw is as basic as the suggestion for the human experience. Mm -hmm. No, I agree, Mike. I mean, Ab when, absolutely fundamental, you know. When I've been, obviously, when I visited you, um, you can you you point out little things. You pointed out little things to me that you've that you've painted and that you've drawn, and it's all within like within walking distance of where you live. You're not you're not a painter perhaps who's who drives out a hundred miles to go and paint something that you might only see once. You know, and you'd rather paint something and draw something that you've seen every day and that you can respond to constantly oh. over time, over over years, over seasons. Certainly, seasons I think are quite important to you. Um, absolutely, absolutely, but familiarity with place. I mean, every year for the best part of 20 years, I'd travel down to the River Wye yeah. for at least a couple of weeks. Yeah. Each other, always to the same place. Yeah. It's an area I'd always felt a lot of affinity with. Uh, you know, I'd known it since being a very young person, really. Mm -hmm. You know, so that worked. I've been mean, going back to exactly the same place all the time. Yeah, that works. Um, I tend to visualize painting of scenery as right. such, you know, sort of. Of course, the great opposite to that is Turner. Mm. You know, we travelled Europe mm -hmm. looking for great subject matter. You know, got fed up on those one of his Welsh Yeah, he came to Wales, didn't he? Came to Wales a couple of times, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. He got fed up because there were no storms. <laughs> the weather was too nice when he was here. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I mean Turner. Turner's absolutely marvellous artist. But yeah. uh, I mean, the opposite would be an equally marvellous artist. Artist constable. Yeah, yeah, constable. Who paid for what was on his doorstep? Yeah, absolutely. For the most part. Yeah, yeah. I love his the skies of constable and that out of this work. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. And you as well, particular series um, of your work, which is the the dancing tree series as well. And you showed it to me as well, the tree, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. And it's just this particular tr twisting sort of tree that's um, that grows in like you, in the field near you, and um, yeah, it's amazing. I love the, I love those paintings. They're they're fantastic. They're yeah, it's a, yeah, it's yeah. An amazing tree, I mean, it's just a, a twisted <laughs> morpho. That's right, that's it. Yeah. It's very difficult. Every, every so often, the, uh, the telephone people come to trim all the trees right. because they affect the telephone wires, you know, rubbing against them. So I always have to protect that tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an important tree, though. I think all trees have anthropomorphic qualities, really, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so there's like another little horse on the way up. Yeah. 
of that one, which always interests me. It, it feels more like uh, more equivalent to my stage of life. It's rather a decrepit, sort of struggling kind of tree, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, I left to my own devices in an ideal world. I would paint people a lot more than I do. Right. But I can't get people to sit for me. Mm. Or perhaps I'm too nervous to persuade them, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I've, I've actually always enjoyed painting a human figure, you know. And, uh, mm. You Not do, necessarily conventional. You've done a lot of self portraits, haven't you? For, yeah. You do your self portraits regularly. Uh, I try I try to do at least one self portrait a year, possibly yeah. two, you know. Yeah. Just as part of that thing of watching yourself aging and changing, you know, it's it's quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, and you you know, you always got marvellous examples. Of course. Nice to have those. Nice to see them. Look at, well, I was looking well, at one in one of your catalogues from the sixties, from the early sixties, which is a very nice one. And then like literally a couple of weeks ago I saw one that you'd done very recently as well. So you retired in 91, that was to concentrate more on painting, I don't know if that sort of sounds right, but you were still involved in education um, and you were developing fine art courses in Liverpool and Bangor. Um. I, I, didn't invo- I didn't intend to be continuously involved, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, they let me wind down gradually from Liverpool. Um, right. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd got to the point where, you know, I was having to do with a very responsible job, which I hated doing. Yeah. Oh, I suppose I must have been okay at them, but, uh, you know, Having to deal with people, well, you know, for example, for somebody with alcohol problems or yeah. uh, somebody not doing their job properly and that kind of stuff, but it depressed me. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was glad to be able to get out when there was a, an offer of, uh, I was about to resign. Right. Uh, but then one of these offers of early retirement came up. Mm. So I, I grabbed it. And they got me to stay on for another year part time. Mm-hmm. So I, I did a couple of days a week for, for another year. And then that was it. But uh, when somebody at Bangor University found out that I was free, uh, got me in to advise Bangor University on the idea of setting up a fine art course. Right. Or really to look at their continuing education programs. And that's all we got to do is because the old um, you know, the universities just have these extended programs for the sort of wider community. Yeah. And they got me to look at some courses they were running. Uh, mm. That they were they were having they were going they were being requested by or ordered by government to bring all their courses even these part time and leisure classes up to degree level mm. and so they got me to go and look at some of these courses to see what uh, what I thought mm. I was doing that and meanwhile I'd been asked to step up I'm, I'm getting this back to fun now first of all I was asked by Wirral Metropolitan College to help them set up a fine art course yeah. Full time and part time version, which I did and carried on as a consultant there for a couple of years. Subsequently, when Bangor found I was free, they'd come across me in other contexts and uh, they got me to look at their courses. And then they asked me to set up a, a part time fine art course for them, mm-hmm. which I did, which I, I kind of uh, oversaw with the help of a, a wonderful secretary who is well qualified as anybody in the British University <laughs> Department, uh, a published novelist. Yeah, right. Uh, being treated as the office dog's body, really. She was wonderful. I worked closely with her to help settle this course, which eventually uh, got the BA, part time BA. It was an unusual approach to fine art education in that the university had no, no premises for it. So we set it up as a distributed learning, right, hiring okay. up village halls all over North Wales with a group of travelling staff. Uh, and at one time it had over 400 students. Mm. So it started off as a kind of foundation course, then there's a degree course, then there's an MA course, mm-hmm. and that was that was marvellous. And I, I I didn't teach on it, just I just did some of the organising and assessments and that yeah. kind of stuff and, and training stuff up. But it was a that, that was a very uh, very warm experience, yeah. which I enjoyed. Mm. But uh, I sort of regret having spent so much of my life in art education. Okay. Because it was pretty much straight from the off, wasn't it? You were teaching like quite, you know, as soon as you'd really qualified, really, you know, you'd, as soon as you got your degree, really, you'd. Um, when I started teaching in art schools, it was wonderful because yeah. they recognised that people teaching in art schools could be practicing artists. Mm. Um, they made it as possible as they could do to continue to practice, both in the college and to give you enough space on your timetable to have days out to do your own painting. Yeah. Which was terrific. Art school as a student was a wonderful experience, and in the early days as a as a teacher, there it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, uh, the students were great. The other staff were a pleasure to work with. But uh, then art schools were taken into polytechnic, and then they were turned into quasi universities. Mm-hmm. 
And I don't think any of that did do any good. They were at the best art schools where they were, the qualification was was a scurrilous piece of paper. Yeah. You know, when you came out, you were judged by your work and mm-hmm. not by your qualification. Yeah. And that's fine. Now, I mean, uh, I can call myself professor. That's it's, right, yeah, I believe you. That's right. It's no bloody use in the art world, but it, <laughs> it, it, it presses another course or two. Oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, no, the uh, the academic elevation of art schools has not been a, mm. a great thing, I don't think, really. So obviously in the 90s, um, you were painting more. You, I mean, you were exhibiting all the way through. You you know, you have exhibited a lot through throughout your yeah, career as well. Yeah. And you had one at Dean Clough, I think, a few years ago. I think that was quite a, a, a good show. That was maybe. I had a big retrospective at the Boston Gallery in San Diego. Right, okay, right. And that sort of, uh, was, that, was that from sea to answering sea? Was it that one? Yeah. Yeah. That travelled to various places in Wales. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were great. They, they framed all the work for me. Got, at the time, I was, I think I was doing my part time or my, my last year at Liverpool. Okay. And they took a lot of the birds off to get to the show show. They were, they were very good. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, oh, some, your, know, some of your work is very large as well, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so sort of heavy, very heavy and large yeah, painting. Yeah, it's heavy some of them, yeah. That's right. But I've had various retrospective exhibitions or so-called retrospective. Yeah, you, had the, that, you had to meet the one in Hong Kong, didn't you, a few years ago, the Muses one. How did that sort of come about? How did that happen? Well, my wonderful model, Sue Lee, yes. had a son, Greg Lee, okay. who I've known since he was a boy. Yeah. And he went on to call a distinguished academic. Mm-hmm. So he, he's probably a quarter Chinese. I think he's probably half Chinese. Right. He studied Chinese law, uh, went on to become quite a, quite a important academic. He, yeah. He ended up in Chicago. So, well, he got me over to Chicago to do a lecture, the annual Moody lecture in Chicago. Mm-hmm. That was an experience. I mean, I, I always busk these things. I don't go along with any preparation. I, I just like to talk off the top of my head. But that's the case, I nearly froze because uh, <laughs> it turned out they were filming the lecture. <laughs> right. I had to I had to write a script for them, which they then installed in the university library. And it was only how to get paid as well. So when I had to deliver this lecture, I, I was introduced and going to the, uh, the previous Moody lectures. Well, that completely unnerved me because they're all names I knew. Not right. artists, but poets and all sorts of people. Right. I was, I was quite rattled there to see them to give them a, a, a lecture on literature art and broke off to give them a lecture on the benefits of free education. Because right. all the students there were, uh, you know, having to work at McDonald's and pay their fees. Yeah. So I thought it was terrible. Of course, we get used to that here now, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. So how, what happened with the Hong Kong one then? How did that sort of come about after that? Well, he we went from Chicago to Hong Kong. Right. Got Ronnie and I, we did this exhibition in Hong Kong together. Okay, yeah. My uh, wife Veronica. That was a joint exhibition. Yes. That was marvellous. I mean, they, everything was cratered up and flowing over there, and then we were flowing out business class. Yeah. Beated wonderfully, and... Uh, yeah, the work's amazing. These are the, So it's the muses, isn't it, is the actual... Is the, is the, uh, well, that, that was part of the project. They, they, they wanted us to do the exhibition, but alongside that, they wanted me to do a series of paintings, more of the transcription yeah. of, the, of the muses to hang in the... Uh, in the new new department that Greg was set up there, yeah. which I did, and uh, well, it's all fine. But eventually, uh, Greg moved on. He's now in France, uh, in Lyon, uh, and they then told me that the the department he'd set up, where these the muses were hung, was being closed down, and they proposed to distribute this series around the rest of the university. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, I said I wasn't particularly happy about that because they were meant to be seen as a suite of works. Yeah. So it was very kind. They threw all the things back to me. Oh, very nice. Right? <laughs> and I, I was unpacking them here when I had a visit from uh, a chap called Terry Mulligan who's bought a lot of my work. Yeah. God bless him. He's, uh, yeah, I know Terry. <laughs> he's bought quite a, quite a hefty collection of my work. And yeah. uh, he came when I was unpacking them said, what did I propose to do? Was I was to try sell them? I said, well, not really. I said, because I want to see them together as a, as a suite of yeah. drawings and painting. He said, well, well, I'll buy them. And so he, he got the lot. There you go. <laughs> uh, and he's, you know, he, well, he's a good chap. He's got, he's got a fine collection of paintings. Of course, yeah. Quite some fine. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a very good collector. That yeah. series, of course, um, which I have seen, you know, Terry obviously has them all together, in, a, in his, you know, in a, which is very nice. 
And of course, that was um, th- those works were shown, weren't they, at the Whitaker um, in 2018? That's, that's yes, they were. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a that was in that exhibition a couple of years ago, which was a really good exhibition. That was that, well, that year, exhibition that was, was Terry set the exhibition up. That's right, yeah. Because I had more or less decided I wasn't going to do any big one person exhibitions yeah. in public space anymore because they're, they're exhausting and mm. you know you don't get anything back in terms financially very rarely. Yeah. But he he organised the whole thing yeah. and prepared the catalogue. Yeah. Which he did a good job on as well. And yeah. uh, made it all very painless, so they, they came here and collected work for me here, mm-hmm. which I thought was going to be just one or two pieces. Yeah. But when they came, they, they took a whole lot more. So the exhibition was half Terry's collection, and half work for my own collection, yeah. plus, the, plus the, the Muses transcription. It, that year, the 2018, I think it was, it was definitely my favourite exhibition of the whole year. It was, it was brilliant. It was. Um, the launch. It was a, I remember it being a really sunny day, and and uh, yeah. it, was a, it was just it just went brilliantly, didn't it? I went back about I think because it's not too far from where I live. I went I think I went back about three or four times to see it after that. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was amazing. It was a really good show that. Um, well, I, I was I was delighted with the venue. Oh, it's a uh, it's a fantastic place. I mean, I, I know there's, uh, there's investment going into that that building at the moment, and there's sort of there is things happening there. Richard fit and had his exhibition there um yes. uh, last year as well which went which went really well and i think it's a fantastic gallery i really i really like it there. oh they, they've done a great job there yeah, credit I, I i don't know exactly taylor knows but they're still there but uh mm. they they were working very hard to yeah, yeah with the it. staff there you know because it was it was on the verge of closing i think at one point as a, as a as a place and they sort of you know they pumped life into it and kept it going really so it was a so no, fair place and they've done a wonderful job you yeah. know they, as well as the gallery space, I mean, they've got this museum of curiosities, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, they've got a lot of taxidermy and stuff. It's obviously just the <laughs> inherited collection of, of um, yeah. over time, but it's, uh, which, it's which I love, you know. Yeah, that's, no, it's uh, good, and hopefully when it extends, it's it restaurant there. No, it's well worth a visit. Is definitely, right? definitely. So, just quickly to talk about um, other people, because we've talked about, I think most of like your career now, I think Mike up to date. Um, your daughter's an artist, is that right? I think is that is that right? Your daughter. Uh, but both my daughters are artists. Both uh, of them. There you go. <laughs> and your wife. And you. <laughs> I think probably. Well, I, I think I think my Ron, Ronnie is 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 the real artist. I think here, yes, you know, she, uh, <laughs> Emma and Becky are both both good artists. But Becky does some terrific drawings and did a, an MA in printmaking. Yeah. But she teaches in a school, which is pretty exhausting these days. Yeah, can imagine it. Emma teaches part time, foundation level, in Ashton Underline. Right. Done, but but they've, they've both tried to keep working and raise families. And, yeah, uh, I mean, Emma, Emma won the, uh, she won the Coffee Williams Prize a few years ago, didn't she, Emma, I think? For, if that's she did indeed, yeah. yeah. There you go. She's had quite a, quite a bit of success, really. So good. And then, of course, just to talk about. Um, just briefly about um, some of your students, I suppose. You know, you've, you'll have seen so many students over the years, but just ones that sort of stand out as names off the top of my head. Really, uh, Jake Attery, of course, is, is, an, is one of the another guy who's a terrific painter who was, um, who again, has been friends with you since, I, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'd, I'm, 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 I'm going to start naming names. I'm, go, I'm going to. Miss out important people. I know, I, I know. Know. This is, I don't, okay. I'll, well, obviously, Jay Catry is one because it, you just, these are, it's me who's naming names. It's not you. It's because you don't have to. <laughs> it's because obviously I know Jake and uh, I think his work's amazing. And um, Helen Clapcott's another one, isn't it? Who's, um, yeah. who's, who's a name of uh, you know, note that I can think of. Um, and, well, I mean, painters are known probably in the North quite well. Yeah, I mean, that's it. That's what it is. Just yeah. Jake and Helen. Yeah. Uh, Colin Beckett has been a reluctant exhibitor, but he's, he's, he's a damn good artist. Yeah, yeah. Sean Smith was a student of yours as well, wasn't he? Well, I was just going to say, he was a student of mine at Will. Right, okay. Is that right? And uh, I first came across him when I was visiting foundation courses, mm-hmm. uh, looking at students. And he was a wildly enthusiastic lad, you know. Yeah. Came to Will, and he's just got better and better, really. Yeah, that's good. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and he's now on this big project been going on for a couple of years now it was the uh, the Mersey Ashtray and the uh, yeah. the bridges and the uh, the power station which you know it's a very ambitious project mm-hmm. I don't know any of that work first hand I mean I don't get around very much these days yeah but he's essentially a photograph of course what he's doing another very good artist who's also been showing up here he lives in London now it's in that barn 
Yeah, oh, she's in advance. Yeah, fantastic. Um, uh, I think she's been showing up colour field gallery, hasn't she? Yeah, she has some large. She does. Um, she does drawings, doesn't she? These huge, yeah. huge uh, drawings. I met. I met her um, at a show at Dean Clough a couple of years ago. Actually, I think it was. She, yeah. was, she had a show there, and she was involved. I've, in that. I've, I've kept in touch with so many students. Really. Uh, yeah. Students. There's a guy in America, uh, isn't there? Isn't a guy in America who you correspond with all the time. Rodney Dixon. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Perfect painter, Rodney. Northern Irishman. Yeah. Big, bad, and dangerous to know. Very good painter. Very good painter. <laughs> it's uh, amazing. You, your your level of correspondence is incredible. Not only, I mean, you like you say, you, going back to the person who taught you from a very young age, Charlie Burton, still being in contact yeah. with him, and and of course an hour back, and and Kossoffer, you know, and then all the way up to in turn you doing what they're doing, and sort of that you're speaking to your students even now after all. It's amazing. It's a it's a fantastic thing. Well, I mean, the great thing about this business is you do meet. Terrific, committed people. Yeah, of course. You know, some of whom will never be heard of in the wider world. Yeah. That's now the end of that. You know, living, living a life isn't just about fame and recognition and all those things. Yeah. It's, uh, it's all about li- living a fulfilled life, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the, the people I, I, I see from time to time, and I don't see many people these days, but people I keep in touch with. Yeah. Um, they're exemplary in that respect, you know. Mm. I mean, Nicholas Horsfield, like you know, I miss terribly. Yeah. He, uh, you know, he, he wasn't just a friend. He was a, he was a very good friend. Yeah. You know, somebody you could turn to at any time. And, and there are others like that, you know. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we're all getting older. Nicholas is gone. <laughs> uh, yeah. Charlie Burton's in his nineties now. Yeah. Frank Frank Arbat in his eighties. Yeah. 80s. yeah. Yeah, Leon, Leon sadly died, didn't he, not too long ago. Leon was over 90 when he died. 90, that's right. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah. you and you go, has gone. He was just, Michael Andrews died young. Yeah. You know, he, he was a marvellous bloke. Yeah. Uh, John Wanacoff, yeah. he's, he's older than I. Well, another painter at Liverpool, I, I, I should have mentioned is uh, Jesse Stample, who's the daughter of Liverpool. Right, I'm okay. still in touch with Jesse now. She's living down near Reading these now, so that's Beautiful painter. She's, I think, she was quite close to Patrick George okay. artistically, but her paintings have something of that architectural quality that the best of Patrick George has got. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, he's gone now. Yeah, I know. Well, we don't want. To, I don't want to be ended on this depressing note, Mike. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what, one thing. One thing. This is just going back to the beginning. This now a little bit because this is just sort of sprung into my mind. You told me once that. Um, and this is totally going off on a tangent, really. That Frank Auerbach said something to you about L.S. Laura. Is that right? Is that does that does that ring any bells? Yes. Back? Yes. Well, tell I me that tale. Went... Tell me that tale. Go on. Well, when I first went to the Slade, and I had to meet my tutor. You know, I think it was when I first met or or an early tutorial. Yeah. He was asking me which artist I was interested in. Um, I, you know, met lots of people, but. Uh, I felt like, I, I thought it, it would be a provocative thing to say. I said I was, I admired Ellis Lowry. Yeah. And he said, oh, so do I. He's a bloody good painter. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> which, which I was, I was, I was quite shocked by because, you know, he's it, it, not a painter you, you think as having, uh, yeah. much more following amongst contemporary artists in London, you know. Yes, exactly, exactly. But, uh. Well, there you it, go. <laughs> Frank, Frank's appetite for painting is, is, is Catholic, you know. I mean, it's, uh, mm. I mean, he's probably the most intelligent, one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. Yeah. You know, and he's got a yeah. you know, fantastic mind. But his, his memory for art and artists is just, uh, it's just amazing. Yeah. All right, well, there you go. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, I'll let you go now. And, uh, I'll let you go and have your tea. Um, it's, been, it's been very nice to speak to you. And, um, yeah, we'll catch up again soon if that's okay. Yes, it's always good to see you. And, yeah, and well, uh, obviously, uh, hopefully, hopefully, you know, post COVID, we are we are booked to go to come to uh, to Wales in, in August. So you never know. We'll see how it goes. Oh, well, you'll be lucky. We've got uh, we've, we've got guards up on the bridge. We don't let any foreigners. Well, that's it. You you still um you still locked up, aren't you? Wales at the moment. So I don't know what, I don't know what's happening. But hopefully, you'll let us in by then. So well, we'll, we'll see. Yes, we are. <laughs> uh, well, the. the the, the bloody uh, virus is still rampant. I know, I know, I know. It's, it's bad. I mean, I it's, um, always, in, in the northwest, obviously, it's, you know, it's. Oh, I don't. Oh, know. I know. Yeah. We'll see what happens anyway. Well, time will tell, and just keep yourself safe. That's all you can do. 
But um, Ali, oh. we'll speak to you soon then, Mike. Take care and love to you and Ronnie, and uh, I'll speak to you soon. Okay. That's your family anyway. All right. See you soon, Mike. Bye now. Bye. Thank you for listening to the episode today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please check out the Northern Art Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash the Northern Art page. And also, we've uh, recently set up a, an Instagram account, which you can check out as well. That's also the Northern Art page on Instagram. Uh, please like, comment, share, message me, whatever you want to do. It's much appreciated, and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.